Hello everyone, Paul Malutnock here. I'd like to go uh, through a, an Old Testament uh, prophecy. Uh, many predictions have been fulfilled by Jesus Christ uh, and have been identified, but no prediction found in the Old Testament is quite as precise or controversial as uh, the Daniel 70 weeks prophecy. There are many interpretations, but I think uh, the majority of theologians had, had come to what I'm going to show you here, uh, which seems very reasonable and, uh, and quite accurate, actually. Uh, the interpretation popularized by Harold Honer uh, years ago uh, is one of the most convincing and accurate and historical. So I'd like to take you through that. <clears throat> and before I do, I'd like to start with a little bit of background uh, up to Daniel 9, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So the kingdom, uh, the Israel, uh, had split into the north and to the south. The northern kingdom called Israel had gone into captivity by the Assyrians in about 70, 722 BC, and the people were dispersed throughout the world. The southern kingdom, Judah, survived that until the Babylonians came, and it's called the Babylonian Conquest, under the king named Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the captivity or the desolation was actually a judgment of God. So what was it a judgment? Uh, why did he judge Israel? Well, he was judging them for their apostasy, their rebellion, their disobedience, their sin, and God used the Babylonians as the judge, which he has done a number of times in the Old Testament. Familiar to us were taken into captivity, the people like Ezekiel and Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, the, the uh, Babylonians completely sacked the city of Jerusalem they destroyed everything in the city, and in particular, the most uh, precious building in the land, which was the temple, was, was set to rubble. And uh, the people then were carried off to foreign lands, and there they would learn the, uh, the new language, new customs, new religion, and so forth. Because of Daniel's abilities, and because of his virtue, he became the character, uh, and his character, in the Babylonian Empire, he rose to be prime minister. So uh, he was a Jew, a captive Jew. He became prime minister of the Babylonian kingdom. Now, he wasn't completely in charge of everything, uh, and he had on his mind his people that were st still under captivity, they were very sad, they were lonely, uh, they uh, were then taken uh, foreign wives and, and those kind of things. Um, so the, the, uh, he lived to the end of the Babylonian kingdom and transitioned into the Medo or Medo Persian kingdom, Persian kingdom. So that was the second great world power to accompany or to encompass. Uh, Israel. So first was the Babylonians, followed by the Medo-Persian kingdom, followed later by the Greek kingdom, and then by the Roman kingdom. And so these four world kingdoms are identified by Daniel in his prophecy. Daniel himself lived in the, the first year of the Medo-Persian kingdom, and that's how Daniel 9 begins. Daniel has been captive for 70 years, <clears throat> and that's an important number because God told Jeremiah that he would take his people captive at the hands of the Babylonians uh, for 70 years. Why 70 years? Because for many, many years, the people of Israel had been disobedient to God's command uh, to, to them back in the Pentateuch, which is the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, to let the land rest every seven years. That's the Sabbath, to let the land rest. Let the land rest and rejuvenate itself in the seventh year. But they ignored that. 
They had plowed right through those sabbatical years for the land to rest. And so 70 year captivity was the way, a God's way of giving the land that rest. The people had failed to give that. And so God accumulated the, all the years that they had not given the land rest and made <clears throat> that number of years for captivities, the 70. He told the prophet Jeremiah that it would be a 70 year captivity. The children of Israel, of course, are in captivity. They are depressed. They are sad, sorrowful. They are under foreign rule. They are being taught uh, that the paganism that dominated that culture, their land is now in the possession of the heathen people. Their holy city is destroyed and their temple is ruined. Daniel, being a man of prayer, uh, as we had read, uh, Daniel had a habit of praying three times a day, in the morning, in the midday, and in the evening, and always prayed on his knees, and always prayed facing Jerusalem. He did this daily. He was a man of consistent devotion of, to God through prayer. In chapter, chapter 9, Daniel begins to pray again. That's where we pick up this prophecy. Uh, but now there's something new. He realizes that because of the calendar, 70 years is almost done. And so it's time in his mind for God to act, to take his people back to the land. So he brought this into mind because of verse 2 of chapter 9 uh, and I'm not going to read all of chapter 9, but the context is, in the first year of the reign of Darius or Cyrus, I, Daniel, observed the books, that is, in the book of Jeremiah, the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, 70 years. So, uh, it's time for the Lord to revive them and take them back to rebuild their city uh, and, of course, their beloved temple. So, Daniel begins to pray. Now, the whole first part of chapter 9 in Daniel is Daniel praying. And he prays, he starts in verse 4 all the way down to verse 19, and it's a prayer that will restore his people. However, most of his prayer is a prayer of confession, a prayer of repentance uh, for his people. Now, verse 21, we meet another important person in this incredible prophecy by the name of Gabriel. You've heard that name before. The arrival or the coming of Gabriel in verse 21 goes this way. While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision, previously came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. Now the extreme weariness was he fasted, he prayed, he fasted, and uh, he was weary, weary from praying, weary from not eating. Now we know that Gabriel is an angel and he is a messenger angel, which is really the same thing. Um, it was Gabriel that came to Zacharias to announce the birth of John the Baptist. It was Gabriel who came to Mary to announce the birth of Jesus. So let's take it up in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Gabriel is speaking to Daniel. And here's what he says. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Now, uh, I'm showing you the purpose of this uh, prayer and what, what Gabriel had just said, uh, just in a, in a bullet point list. The prophecy contains the statement concerning God's sixfold purpose in bringing these events to pass. Verse 24 says this purpose is the following, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, 
to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, these things are not things that happened back then or finished their 70 years. This is something to happen in the future. These results concern the total uh, eradication of sin and the establishment of righteousness. The prophecy of the 70 weeks summarizes what's going to happen before Jesus sets up his millennial kingdom. The third in the list of results is to atone for wickedness. Jesus accomplished the atonement for sin by his death on the cross. And we read that uh, referenced in Romans chapter 3, 25 and Hebrews chapter 2, 17. So in verse 24, Gabriel says, 77s, that's really the literal words for it, uh, and are, degreed, are decreed for your people and your holy city. Almost all commentators agree that the 77s should be understood as 70 weeks of years. In other words, a period of 490 years. So this is a prophecy about something that's going to happen 490 years from some date. And I'll, I'll go through what that date is. These verses provide kind of a clock, a chronological order that gives the idea of when the Messiah would come and when his, uh, what the events would be that would accompany his appearance. Let's read uh, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And then, verse 26, And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Now, I believe that anointed one is Christ. <clears throat> and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decree dis uh, decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half of a week. He shall put an end to sacrifice and offerings. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Okay, a lot of stuff in there. Let me try to go through and explain the prophecy. The prophecy goes on to divide the 490 years into three smaller units, one of 49 years, one of 434 years, and one of seven years. Now, the final week of seven years is further divided in half. Verse 25 said, From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Seven sevens is 49, and 62 sevens is another 434 years, which then adds up to 483 years. That's seven years short of the 490. Now, Gabriel said that the prophetic clock would start at the time that a decree was issued to rebuild Jerusalem. From that date of that decree to the time of the Messiah would be 483 years. <clears throat> we know from history that the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was given by King Artaxerxes of Persia at 444 BC. So it's in Nehemiah chapter 2. The first unit of 49 years or seven sevens covers the time it took to rebuild Jerusalem with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, which they were always surrounded by uh, unfriendly neighbors. This rebuilding is chronicled in the book of Nehemiah. It's all about the building of the wall and the city and the temple. Now, that decree of 444 BC 
uh, is the last decree, the one that actually allows them not only to build buildings, but also to start sacrifices again. There are decrees before that that some commentators use to start the time clock that come up a little bit short. But I believe that's, this is the correct uh, starting point of uh, when the king of Persia uh, allowed them to begin uh, sacrificing again. Now, converting the 360-day year used by the ancient Jews uh, of 483 becomes 476 years on the solar calendar. Adjusting for the switch from BC to AD, because there's going to be two years coming up to zero and then going on from there, uh, after 444 BC, uh, places us at AD 33, which would coincide with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and the prophecy in Daniel, Daniel 9 specifies that after the completion of the 483 years, the anointed one, quote, the anointed one will be cut off, end quote. Uh, verse 26, this was fulfilled when Jesus was crucified. Now, Daniel 9, 26 continues with a prediction that after the Messiah is killed, the people of the ruler who will come to destroy the city and the sanctuary, this is fulfill, uh, fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, the ruler who will come is a reference to the Antichrist, who it seems will have some connection with Rome, since it was the Romans who destroyed Jerusalem in the first place. Okay, So, the final week of the 70 weeks. So we went through the 490. We ended up with Jesus' crucifixion. And now the seven, uh, the 77s. Uh, of the 77, 69 have been fulfilled in history. This leaves one more seven yet to be fulfilled. Most scholars believe that we're now living in a huge gap between the 69th and the 70th week. The prophetic clock has been paused, as it were. The final seven of Daniel uh, is what we usually call the tribulation period. Daniel's prophecy reveals some of the actions of the Antichrist that we can pick up on, the, quote, ruler who will come. Verse 27 says he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, or, or seven years. However, in the middle of the seven, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation in the temple. Jesus warned of this event in Matthew 24, 15. After the Antichrist breaks the covenant with Israel, a time of great tribulation, it begins, uh, and then that's, that's uh, referenced in Matthew 24, 21. Daniel also predicts that the Antichrist will face judgment. We know from Revelation that he will. He only rules until the end, and that is the creed that is poured out on him in Daniel 9, 27. God will only allow evil to go so far, and the judgment of the Antichrist will face uh, uh, judgment, and it has already been planned out. This is the picture of the seven weeks of Daniel, and so you could see the uh, beginning, uh, at Nehemiah, uh, they used uh, in this one 445, 444, uh, the 49 years, and then the 434 years, which, uh, which uh, accounts for 483 years. And then you zip uh, further, which we don't know when it's going to start, but it will probably start at the, uh, uh, at the um, rapture. And then you have the seven-year tribulation, and then uh, that the Antichrist will be uh, put away at that point. So I hope this is helpful. Uh, you may have to go through this more than once. Uh, I certainly did and uh, and studied it. And again, you're going to see some different interpretations of this, but I think this is the one that has been most popular and seems to be coming through the clearest and, uh, and based on history and uh, is the most accurate. So I hope that uh, 
is some help to you. And uh, God bless you. And may this, uh, may this video be shared with others. And if you would uh, like it, or if you have not become a subscriber, if you can click subscribe, that would be very helpful to me. Thank you very much and God bless. Amen.